Hey guys, Mr. P. In this video, we're going to talk about some of the major technological advancements in the area of microbiology and how those technologies led to further discovery and further understanding of the cell. So the first thing we need to talk about is how the invention of the light microscope and how the technology of the light microscope led to a really profound discovery in that the compound light microscope invented in 1595 led to our discovery of the cell in 1665. Until the cells were discovered, a lot of people at the time thought that spontaneous generation was a thing. They thought that living things spontaneously appeared from thin air. They didn't know that living things were composed of cells. They didn't know that cells were the basic unit of life, and so not only did this compound light microscope open up our eyes to the living kind of micro world around us, but it also led to our development of the cell theory. Electron microscopy is a more recent microscopy technique. There are two versions, the scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope. Both of these techniques utilize electrons as their energy source instead of light, and so their resolving power and magnification are gonna be better, but the scanning electron microscope is going to use these beams of electrons to actually strike the surface of a specimen and then a detector connected to a computer is going to take all of the data from those electrons bouncing off of the specimen and provide you a three-dimensional image of the specimen at really really good resolution. The transmission electron microscope is going to use the beam of electrons but it's going to focus them through an image so because they are going to go through the image it's going to give you more of the the internal components, not in 3D but in 2D, but it will let you look inside kind of like an x-ray. Both of which use a beam of electrons. The scanning electron microscope, like I said, uses a beam of electrons to scan the surface of the specimen, while the transmission electron microscope is going to aim that beam of electrons at a very thin section of a specimen. Those electrons are going to pass through the specimen and the inner structure can be viewed. If we look at some of the images that these microscopy techniques can produce, the scanning electron microscope will scan the surface. You can see that all of these structures are very, very small. When you look at the scale bar, this particular scale, scale bar is 10 micrometers, and so this particular pollen grain might actually be like 18 micrometers in diameter. Very small, but very good magnification and very good resolution. Again, scanning electron microscope allows you to see the surface, while the transmission electron microscope will give you an equivalent resolution and magnification, you can see that surface detail isn't possible with the transmission electron microscope because that beam of electrons is actually going through the specimen. Electron microscopy has increased the total magnification, which remember is the magnification produced by all lenses, to 300,000 times from what was traditionally capable of the light microscope at 1,000 times. So our technology with the light microscope is really good. It allows us to see living specimens that can move at 1,000 times magnification, but the electron microscope allows us to take that magnification way further and enter kind of that 300,000 times of magnification. Substantially more magnification allows us to see substantially smaller objects. Electron microscopy has increased the resolution from 0.3 micrometers to 0.001 micrometers. So again, we can zoom in and actually resolve between two really closely related objects to 0.001 micrometers. That's substantially better. So in addition to our microscopes, the light microscope being invented and leading to the discovery of the cell and the electron microscope being invented and leading to increased magnification and resolving power, there are some microscopy techniques that have furthered our understanding of the cell and the structural components of the cell. And one of those is freeze fracture. This technique is a process of preparing a sample for observation with electron microscopy. So this is a technique that will utilize the electron microscopy in order to make our understanding of the structures that we're looking at more clear. It involves the rapid freezing of a biological specimen. In this case, we're looking at a particular section of the membrane, but it physically freezes them and then will physically break them. That's called fracturing, which is why it's called freeze fracture. So we freeze the specimen and then we fracture it. And because we can fracture it along planes that we want to look at, like we specifically froze a membrane, we split it open between the two layers of phospholipids and then 
examined those samples through or via electron microscopy. This technique specifically has increased our understanding of the cell and has furthered our understanding of microscopy in general and has further diversified the techniques we can use in tandem with microscopy. This particular, this specific technique has also reinforced the idea of the fluid mosaic model, which we'll talk in detail about in a later video. But the fluid mosaic model is how we describe the cell membrane with all of the membrane components, proteins, and such. Cryogenic electron microscopy is another one of those technological advancements that we use in tandem with microscopy. It furthered our knowledge of structural biology. It utilizes low temperatures to freeze specimens in ice before bombarding them with a beam of electrons. So unlike just normal electron microscopy where you are coating the samples in a heavy metal or you're slicing them very thin to send the beam of electrons through, this particular technique freezes the samples and then shoots them with electrons because we are not preparing them with a heavy metal and we're just freezing them, we don't actually have to increase their size, so to speak, by coating them in the metal. And so it enables an image to be formed using computer enhancements that shows the three-dimensional framework of proteins at near atomic resolution. That's the really, really important. Because we are just freezing the molecule as is, we can really get at the detail of the molecule, in this case a protein, the quaternary protein, the three-dimensional conformation of this protein can be seen at near atomic levels, which helps us understand the function of the cell and what the cell uses to function correctly. This particular technique, the cryoelectromicroscopy, has advanced our understanding of virus composition and virus structure, cell membrane components and their arrangement, and the cellular protein synthesis, even sometimes heredity expression and regulation, because a lot of this hereditary expression and the regulation of expressed traits is most of the time the result of a particular protein. Another example using the cryogenic electron microscopy is with COVID-19. So the, the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus spike protein is used when the virus binds to and infects a host cell. The structure of the protein was first elucidated using cryogenic electron microscopy in 2020, fostering the development of the pharmaceutical drugs that might inhibit the protein and prevent infection. This is the actual 3D conformation of that spike protein. That is the exact protein that the coronavirus will utilize in order to infect the host. Again, we know a little bit about viruses at this point in the class. Viruses contain their own DNA or RNA, and they have to inject that DNA or RNA into the host cell. And a lot of times they use these spike proteins to help bind them and infect the host cell. Immunofluorescence or the use of fluorescent stains is another one of the techniques that can be used in tandem with microscopy techniques and it involves utilizing fluorescent stains that combine with specific cellular components. So in this particular image you can see that there are a variety of antibodies. We have primary antibodies in this green color and we have secondary antibodies in this kind of darker blue color. Antigens exist as surface proteins on the surface of a lot of cells and viruses. And so because we know that there are particular antigens available on particular cells, we can utilize primary and secondary antibodies that have been tagged or linked to a fluorophore, which is a particular fluorescent stain molecule. And once those antibodies have been tagged with those the fluorescent dye molecules, they can then be attached to the antigen like they normally do. And now we have just fluorescently marked the cells based on the interaction of the antigen and antibody. Specific antibodies combined with unique colored dyes recognize and combine with target molecules, which allows the target, usually protein, to be detected. All this is, is a particular antigen-antibody interaction. If we label the antibody and then allow it to attach to the specific antigen that it is specific for, we can radioactively or fluorescently dye these particular cell components, usually protein, because the antibodies are protein and the antibodies are going to attach to antigens, which are also protein, and we can then start to look for the presence of those particular antibodies within a living tissue sample. And so when the living samples are irradiated with ultraviolet light, the parts that accepted the dye will fluoresce. So you will see that in this particular image, which is a sample or a tissue sample, you can see that most cells are not glowing, but some cells are fluorescing. And the reason they are fluorescing is because they have been infected with the host cell. And therefore, when we send these radioactive markers or these fluorescent markers in and they attach themselves specifically to that 
viral protein antigen, they will accept the dye and therefore glow. This technique is often used to detect viral proteins that have infected cells. It also is a technique that has been used to identify cancer cells when looking at a tissue sample. A little bit more about the immunofluorescent or the use of the fluorescent stains and how we kind of first utilize them to learn about the cell membrane is that we used a membrane protein that was marked with green fluorescent dye. So we took a cell with membrane proteins marked with a green dye. We then took a completely different cell and marked their membrane proteins with a red fluorescent dye. We allowed them to fuse, the two cells fused together. And it's important to note that when those cells fused, the markers of each color remained segregated because they, at that point, didn't have enough time to mix up, become homogenous. And so then, then after a certain amount of time, membrane proteins are mixed over hybrid cell surface and that gave rise to our understanding of the fact that these proteins that are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer are not at all rigidly stuck. They do in fact move and this technique and uh, experiment allowed us to see that. This technique too led to the development of the current model which is called the fluid mosaic model which states that all of these cellular components or all of these membrane components are kind of randomly assorted throughout the membrane and they are not rigidly stuck. They do move. That's it for this video. If you learned something give it a thumbs up, subscribe. We'll see ya.